Hi, everybody. It's Kevin Raver, and I'm back with another Conversations With. And today I'm very, very lucky to have my friend and uh, fellow photographer, William Neal, with me. And uh, William and I have gone uh, kind of go way back for a while now. Um, I've always respected his photography, saw and always read every single article he had published in Outdoor Photography Magazine and thought, God, this guy's pretty cool. One of these days I need to meet him. And uh, we had an opportunity a number of years ago where I needed an instructor for Antarctica. And uh, I gave Bill a call and said, hey, Bill, you don't really know me for Adam, but are you interested in teaching in, on a trip to Antarctica? And normally when I do this, I, uh, people jump through the phone and go, wow, yeah, what an opportunity, sure. And Bill was really kind of cool and laid back. I was, well, I don't know. You know, um, there, you know um, <laughs> it was like, I said, you know, and I had to do a sales job to actually get him to, to jump on board. And uh, Bill, you jumped right on board after a little bit of a, a sales call. Any uh, regrets? No regrets at all. Nope. I'm glad it all worked out, and uh, it was an experience of a lifetime. You produced a magnificent book uh, on that trip. Um, I think it was what, Dreams of Antarctica or something, Is was it called? Antarctic Dreams, yeah. Antarctica Dreams. A lovely, lovely book. I'm glad you made a project out of that. Um, is that still available, too, so we can put a link into the site? Yeah, it's av available as a PDF. So it's an ebook and um, five days of photography, and I didn't feel like I was padding it with extra shots it was just high quality the whole five days quite a unique experience for william william is uh and i'm going to call him bill because unless you want to be called william i call always call you bill um but bill has uh his his roots um in yosemite uh he goes way back uh he's been photographing in yosemite for ages doesn't live too far from yosemite um and uh you know, he probably knows every cool spot to photograph in Yosemite. And uh, taking Bill to Antarctica, um, I think, probably was kind of a challenge for you because it was something new. Um, you know, there are no overlooks. There is no uh, set your tripod legs here and come away with something like everybody else had. It's a kind of a dynamic landscape, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I, asked, I probably asked you 10 times at least before we left. No tripod? Really? I couldn't couldn't quite adjust to that, but um, once we got there, you know, it, it all made sense, and uh, I had to adapt pretty quickly to um, a different style of shooting, and and it was a good challenge, and uh, you know, I, I had to catch up on my autofocus, uh, you know, uh, image stabilization, make sure everything was working, and and uh, came out great. Well, your your photographs um, were 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 beautiful, and and. It's it's always nice when, and you might see this when you take people to Yosemite, but, you know, when you go to some uh, a location so many times, and I've been to Antarctica 20 plus some odd times, uh, and probably seen a lot of it, one of the greatest joys for me is to watch people on their first trip and, and their reaction to, you know, the scenery and the environment. Because, I mean, it is big and it does come at you fast. And it does make you change your way. So, you know, I, I always was looking over at you and smiling as you're discovering new things. And uh, it was always quite the pleasure. And the, the results of, from your work was tremendous. My jaw was dropped most of the trip. <laughs> and, you know, walking through the passageways on ship and going to meals, and you know, I just, just kind of sat there. The first thing I had to do coming off the boat was to download. I got to make sure this is on a hard drive somewhere. Quick. <laughs> and so, like, before going to a meal, it was run to the cabin, heck, hook up the download, and, you know, back things up on a couple of drives because I knew something amazing was going on. Yeah. And and for those that are wondering why Bill said, well, you told me I couldn't bring a tripod, um, on the way we travel down there, we fly on an airplane, and, and there's a weight limit because it's um, landing at a Russian base on a gravel runway, and there's just so much baggage you can take with you. And... Uh, for the most part, because we're either on the ship or a Zodiac and on land, um, uh, very less time, I mean, in the sense of, of dividing it all up, um, a tripod is something that's not really needed. Um, for all of us that are shooting landscape, I guess we get accustomed to the camera on the tripod where we can make adjustments and watch the scene change. 
um, and you know wait for the light to be right. Uh, and it's kind of a it's kind of a standard thing. But the Antarctica teaches you very quickly that you don't need this tripod. That you need to be able to see and you can compose with the modern cameras. You can shoot at high enough I, um, ISOs and shutter speeds to you know get a sharp image. And uh, you know you'll be finding you'll be shooting with a variable number of different lenses too because it's a uh, it's it's that different. It's really you know the landscape's coming to you. So usually on land, you know, you're I'm shuffling around with my tripod and getting spaces just right and and lining things up. And on the ship, you know, you're moving past icebergs and the the arrangements of shapes change as you move. And you you I started to learn to anticipate. You know, that might be something, and I'd watch it, you know, and it's coming by you. And you just start shooting and trying to catch the, the right alignment of things. So it was a blast. It was really fun to try to do that. And with some practice, you know, you learned. And, and sitting on the Zodiac was different, too, because I really liked the, um, you know, the reflections you could get in some of the places. And, you know, at first I started shooting fairly wide open, and all the ripples in the foreground were blurry and so I started cranking up ISOs and stopping down a little bit more and trying to pull uh, you know not only the icebergs in, in focus but the the ripple patterns was so it was kind of a depth of field thing that that was action photography with you know a strong foreground that you wanted to get sharp I said what is this coming at me and kept on you know every night going through the images I'd learn a little bit more and be a little bit smarter going back out to to the next uh, round of you know the ship passing things and then out on the zodiac circling around icebergs and all of that you, you catch on pretty quick and i think what's unique is like when you are on a zodiac or even on the ship uh, you know we're all taught to uh, have foregrounds and you know the way i should be drawn to the background or where the subject is depending on what we're shooting and you know, in, when you're actually in a, something where you're moving, that foreground can change. You know, iceberg on the left, a little bergy bit, which looks pretty good. You know, as you zoom by, becomes and goes into the center, and all of a sudden changes a difference. So your compositions actually change, and then you start beginning to what would you say anticipate the composition, knowing how the foregrounds change by the way you're moving against the foreground and background and subject. You know, you you got a whole variety of things happening, so you almost become to the point where you're anticipating where you're going to shoot that shot because you get accustomed to how that environment works. Yeah, or you just hold the shutter down. <laughs> just, <laughs> there it goes. Machine <laughs> gun fire, here it comes. And, uh, you know, I have so many sequences of passing icebergs where uh, I, I loved what I was seeing, and here it comes, and I have, you know, two, three, four, ten frames, you know, and then, you know, you have you have to bracket in that sense because of the motion, and you know, you as you as you get used to it, you start to be better at anticipating and and shooting maybe less frames blazing away. But you know, it was uh, it was just fun to to be kind of torqued into a new way of shooting and and uh, highly motivated to try to catch some beautiful images of what what all the ama amazing places were. It was a great time. You know, one, one of my other great times with Bill, and I've learned an awful lot from, from Bill. Um, back at my other job, um, you know, the, um, I don't say the name anymore, but you know, it's the green oriented site at you know, LL. Um, I wanted to try to do something very special. And I created a, a video series called shooting with masters. And, um, uh, Bill graciously volunteered to be our, our first master. And um, it involved, you know, going out in the field and spending five days with Bill and watching how he shoot. And we decided to do this in Yosemite. And every single day we had bright, sunny blue skies. It was like, oh my God, the worst conditions we could ever, you know, photograph in. And I was always hoping that we were going to have clouds and rains and downpours and all sorts of things like that. But, um, I learned so much from you, Bill, and that video is still available over on that other site. Um, but uh, one of the things I learned from you is it's always not the big landscape. You know, you learn to adapt to the lighting and the conditions uh, that you're in. And uh, you got me thinking and seeing and something I believe strongly in is uh, finding the picture in the picture. 
you know, we were out on that one set of rocks at one day, which was you know a lot of glacial sheen. What do you call that? that oh yeah, glacial polish. Glacial yeah, polish, yeah. And well, you've got a big scene there, which typically you want to pull out your wide angle lens and shoot. Found that many of the photographs actually happened when I put a long lens on and started focusing on elements of the big picture and uh, learned an awful lot uh, along the way doing that. So, um, you know, the, it's always learn something new and, you know, you're never quite the master. Like Bill had to adapt to Antarctica, but you'll do it quickly. You know, uh, I never shot with anybody like Bill and you know, we were photographing flowers and woods and all sorts of things on that trip and talking about the philosophies of life and, and photography too along the way. So it was really, really a cool trip. Even on sunny days, four days straight of, of sunshine, and I was trying to pick places where there'd be either a good effect because of the strong light, like something backlit or gosh, you know, those flowers are out in the meadow. Remember the meadow we were out? At? Oh, that was and quite cool. We got out there when, uh, in the evening when it was soft light. And even though the days had been sunny, that was the right conditions to be in that type of place. So it was a, it's a matter of, you know, having been in a place you can pick, you know, this type of day, I'm going to have to photograph this type of subject. And you adjust, just like adjusting on the, on the uh, Zodiacs. Well, you know, I think the, the thing I see a lot in my workshops, and I don't know if you see it on yours, is that I have a lot of people who would come on a photography workshop that have a problem adjusting. They, you know, they photograph one thing and they have a one way of, they, they want to try to photograph it and they have a very hard time breaking out of that paradigm. And um, as a result, I think they, they miss vision, if you know what I'm saying. Well, sometimes people lock into the type of subjects they want to take and, and then... You know, have a t have a hard time adapting to. Well, now I'm going to have to photograph something entirely different, and you know, if you let the frustration get a hold of you, then the creative juices stop flowing, and you know, you get blocked, creatively speaking. But you just have to be be flexible, go with the flow of the light or the day or the weather, and uh, take what nature gives you because it's. I'm always amazed at what I see. I. I see a hundred more things that excite me than are photogenically something I'd want to stop and photograph. So I just get, you know, I have this um, lifelong sense of wonder for, for things and that it kind of carries me through. That's the reason I'm out there really. And so the process of those discoveries are, are more exciting than, than the results of a photograph. So it takes pressure off because I'm there to enjoy myself and then, you know, if something comes together photographically, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not locked into too many, um, oh, fixed ideas. So I just go, go with what yeah, I'm given for open, that day. Keep an open mind. So, well, let, let's take a, a, a way back uh, journey for a minute. Um, you know, we kind of talked about some of the things that are recent, but you know, who, who is. William Neal. I mean, tell us a little bit about your history because it's fascinating. Um, and uh, nobody would know you were a redhead once, but <laughs> you started back a long time ago and fill us in a little bit and how you got involved, uh, specifically where you spend most of your time at Yosemite and more so with uh, your adventures with Ansel Adams. Before getting to Yosemite, I, growing up, we went to national parks in the summers, you know, not you know, just for a week or two, and I, I got, um, really enjoyed those trips. And so when I got out of high school, I ended up spending um, two summers in Glacier National Park and two summers in North Cascades National Park uh, during college. And so I loved being in those places. I started getting serious about photography, and I was looking for a job. I said, I'm out of college, what am I going to do? And since I had worked for the National Park Service, I applied for a job in Yosemite, and I ended up in Yosemite uh, soon after college. This is in way back, the late 70s. And taking lots of photographs, I would take my film to be processed at Ansel's Gallery in Yosemite Valley. And um, one day in 1980, 
I went in there and was offered a job to work there. My friend Lewis Kemper was working there as the staff photographer and he he wanted to go freelance and I walked in and turning in my slide film, I said, so he knew I was looking for work. You, you want my job? And I said, uh, yeah, a little faster than I responded to you going to Antarctica. <laughs> yeah. I said, sure. And so I, all of a sudden, from a National Park Service laborer, I was a staff photographer at Ansel's Gallery. So Ansel's daughter-in-law ran the gallery, and I, I uh, you know, a few weeks later, you know, Ansel shows up with his June workshops. He did two one-week workshops in the middle of June for years and years and years. And so being an employee there, I got to meet him. I got to meet uh, John Sexton and Alan Ross and all kinds of the famous photographers would come and teach for him. So for five years, I worked at Ansel's Gallery, and every summer I got to, to be involved with his workshops and meet. Got to be good friends with Jerry Yulsman. I met Ernest Haas, and I met Paul Caponegro, uh, Richard Miserec, Robert Glenn Ketchum. All these people uh, gave me an insight to how different people were doing their photography creatively, but also how they were sur surviving doing their photography. And in 1983, while working for Ansel's family, I gave uh, my boss, his daughter-in-law, a box of prints. And she took them to see Ansel and showed the box of prints. And Ansel accepted my photographs uh, into the gallery as, as being representing my work. So that was kind of a, besides working there, which was a great experience, I also got you know, represented by the gallery. So since 1983, they've been selling my work there. Even to even today, they're still selling them. It's always cool to go in there and see your images. In that, you know, that was a great learning experience. I always call my time at Ansel's Gallery as my master's degree. So in 1984, I, I, uh, the same year he passed away, I decided to go freelance. So I'd been self-employed since uh, 1984. And you're teaching and you're selling and more than anything else, uh, you're, you're, you've done some magnificent books and uh, really, really pretty books, um, which is a, another story I want to tell you about. We have two books. I mean, one book I really love is uh, this book here, uh, your retrospective, I guess it is. And yeah. it's just, it's one of my uh, prized coffee table books and, it's got not only a, a beautiful cover to it, but uh, just the photography uh, inside it is just extraordinary. Um, and I, I've, I've loved looking at this. This has got Antarctica pictures in it. There's one photograph here, which is Bill knows, I keep saying it's one of my favorites, which is, uh, that's from Tunnel View, correct? Correct, correct. And um, <laughs> It's got all the elements that you look for. And, of course, none of the elements I've ever had with, with, on my many visits to Yosemite. But uh, Kevin keeps asking, when, when are you going to deliver that for me, Bill? <laughs> yeah. Come on, dude. Get it yeah. done. We'll get, we'll get you out here a few more times to see what yeah, we can do. One of these days. Um, we, were, we were together last, uh, I think it was early November, wasn't it, Tom? Yeah, that time of year is good for fall color, so. I teach private one-on-one -on -one workshops, so I was doing that. And then uh, Charlie or, or other people, you know, run workshops the end of October and, or early November. The Ansel Adams Gallery has excellent series of workshops. And so they do a couple of workshops at a time. So, you know, you bump into people at, at, the, uh, at those locations where people gather. The climbing history in Yosemite is pretty amazing. I mean, we concentrate on the the photographic history with Ansel Adams and um, all that follow that. But there's the, the climbing history is pretty remarkable too. So when, when you started photographing, you were probably working with a medium format or actually you know, sheet film cameras, four by fives, weren't you? Well, I started shooting seriously in 74 with a Pentax Spotmatic. Oh, so really? that was during college. So I used 35 millimeter until 
a couple of years uh, working at Ansel's Gallery, I was seeing everybody using view cameras and, and figured there was a good reason for that. And so uh, in 82, I started using 4 by 5 So and I used that camera primarily for about 20 years. And then you made the switch to digital. And uh, how do you think that changed your life when you moved to, to, to working in the digital realm? You want to go back? No, I don't. And, and people ask me all the time. Oh, don't you miss it? And, you know, there's a lot of opinions about that in film or digital. And I, I just happily changed gears. Um, you know, I think I got going when, when the cameras were really starting to, to uh, deliver. I didn't have to worry about spending $3 a shot to process. I didn't have to worry about getting film scanned. I mean, I still have thousands of four by fives that need to be scanned that, that are really worth, you know, resurrecting, so to speak. So with, with digital, I don't have that problem. I, I can go back to when I started and there are photographs I took in early days of digital, like 2004, 2005, just when Canon was coming out with the one DS and, um, uh, you know, I, I have access to all of those. So, um, you know, I, I really value the time I used a view camera and, and the quality of the images I took, but it also taught me a lot of discipline in terms of um, getting the shot right in the field. You know, it was kind of pre uh, Photoshop where I, w I wasn't using it yet anyway. And, and I had to be disciplined. I had to be judicious with, you know, the, my composition and precise and there was no way to, you know, to extend a border or clone something out um, at the time I was making those photographs. So the discipline I learned as using a four by five really helped me uh, switching to digital, even though, you know, I could shoot and start shooting a lot more, but I still had the, the same kind of a approach and a, and a sense of composition, sense of design that it was kind of enforced by using the view camera for, for so many years. I think one of the things that I experienced early on, and see if you agree with the, the digital side of things, you know, when, when I had spent a lot of time shooting four by five film also out there, um, the thing that amazed me about digital, especially, you know, since the last five years or so is the ability of the wide range I mean, being able to, to, to photograph the values from, you know, pure whites to pure blacks and all the things in between rather than, you know, kind of sliding that scale around to where you really wanted it. And, you know, one of the things that I think I love the most is the fact that, you know, the subtleties that you can pull out of shadows these days. And, you know, yeah. your eye wants to explore an image that was really hard to do sometimes with film. While the film might be, the image might be dramatic, your eye wanted to see more of that image. Well, if you consider it data collection, so if the, you know, if the performance is the print, then, you know, you want to um, capture as much data as possible. And with four by five transparency, I had five stops to work with. And the last several years of printing four by five, a lot of uh, contrast masking was being done. And I, I use labs that did contrast masking. So you could, you can improve shadow detail, for example, um, by somewhat elaborate, you know, processes and printing and, uh, you know, but, but the joy of having, you know, a full range of detail, you know, whatever 14 stops or something is just, it just gives you a range of possibilities in terms of, of interpretation. Yep. And then and the modern sensors, like the, the Sony sensor I use is just pure joy because I can lift up the shadows as much as I want and, and not get much noise at all. And, you know, the high ISO, okay. high ISO capabilities are quite nice, too. I, I do that once in a while, but mostly uh, I'm at, you know, 100 and, and uh, want to get the full, full range of detail in the, in the shadows. Yeah. And clean and, shadow is the biggest thing. You know, you clean shadow, and, of course, even at the lower shutter speeds, I'm using a tripod now, um, you know, the, the noise issues aren't so much a challenge these days, and there are tools, obviously, to get rid of those. <clears throat> Let me come back to contrast masking for a second, just so our viewers understand 
if if they're not um, they have never understood what a contrast mask is. And you know, you can elaborate too, Bill. But what a contrast mask was was when you shot transparencies. Many times you would take a separate piece of film, which was kind of a a black and white film. I, it was very low contrast black and white, and you uh, contact print those together. And then there was a separation. And also because the way it's exposed, when you sandwich them together and align them properly, allows you to pull more from the the, the combined uh, mask as well as the, uh, the the original. The black and white mask would be, you know, clear in the shadows and dense dense in the highlights. So it would hold, you know, the mask itself would hold the um, the, sh- the highlights down by blocking a certain amount of light, and then the the shadows would be much more clear and, and give you a lot more possibility. And then you could still dodge and burn. It wasn't like you just depended on the mask. It just it was, got you in a, it got it you a, a wider contrast range. Yeah, it was a, it was a lot of steps though, because you you know you had to make sure that the everything was dust free and sandwich it in and put it between the glass, expose it properly, make sure you had the right exposure, and then develop it and sandwich it, put it in the enlarger. <laughs> I mean, God, what we went through yeah. to make pictures back then. Well, I can tell you, I never did that. You know, so I I had I worked with labs that you know, knew how to do it right. And so I have a lot of four by fives with little register register holes punched in them. And um, when I started scanning those images, you know, later on, uh, you know, I had to peel off the tape and peel off the contrast mass. And and um, I guess you could scan a, a four by five with a contrast mass. You could do that, yeah. That's probably, you know, would result in the same sort of thing. Well, it's been it's been a journey that way. So let's let's talk about where we are today and what you're doing. You're you're still out photographing almost every week, right? You know, it depends a little bit on the season, but I photograph a lot around my home. You know, I built this home uh, 20 years ago. You know, just outside of Yosemite, so I'm in the the foothills of the Sierra, and I have oak trees and manzanita and and wildflowers, and you know. I, I built a waterfall in my backyard. So I photograph that sometimes, and uh, I keep my my uh, myself engaged in in nature that way. And I really advocate for people to to find local things to photograph because so many people that I work with only photograph when they go on vacation. So the camera's been in the bag for a month or so or two, and and to go out on a trip and they're not in shape, visually speaking. Mm-hmm. So uh, it really keeps my uh, my interest and my photographic eyes working by, you know, watching what happens to the light. You know, this time of year, you know, maybe I'm looking at my waterfall in the mid afternoon where there's a shadow that strikes it just right, or this reflected light just right, and and you know, a lot of times I just look. But every once in a while, you know, I just go, time to go to work. And I go jump out of my back patio and start photographing. Or, if, you know, flowers are blooming, you know, spring is, is just finishing, but I had, I still have poppies blooming. But, you know, I have a plum tree and that blooms in February, early March. And then my irises come up and, you know, I couldn't get up to Yosemite for dogwood season, but that's always a big, big occasion for me. Isn't it funny though? I mean, I I don't know if you ever saw the movie Glengarry Ross, which was uh, one of Alec Ald- uh, Alex Baldwin's first movies, and he's a a sales manager, and he used an expression in there: "Always be closing." A B C. Well, I I, mean, I have that uh, something I always preach is A B S. Always be seeing, and you kind of brought that up in a minute ago, and the fact that you know it's amazing what you see when you're looking. And, you know, whether it's in your own backyard or driving down the street, all of a sudden you might find that one tree that just has the right look and, you know, a hollow inside the woods that, you know, you got to jump out and shoot a picture. But I find, you know, I'm, I'm always seeing like I'm looking through a camera. I mean, it's, it's yeah. I don't know how to describe it, but it's an obsession almost, you know. It's a daily practice, you know. I, I think that's a better term than obsession, but it's well, maybe. similar. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a matter of choice of words. But, you know, for me, uh, seeing 
uh, photographically seeing beauty, looking for beauty is, is a great ballast in, in a world that's you know, full of some negative things. And I, I need to counterbalance that. So not only in just my daily process and uh, realizing there's a lot of good stuff in the world, uh, photographically and otherwise, that that staying engaged, uh, seeing you know, the world in a positive way, really helps my mental state of mind. You know, it's it's, just, it's a ballast in the the sea, the tempest sea. So tell me a little bit about what you've been doing. Uh, you know, we've all been stuck in the um, lockdown pandemic mode, and uh, you've certainly had to make some adjustments to your business. Um, you know, tell us a little bit about what you've been doing and working on. Well, it worked out quite well. At first, it was pretty frustrating. I, I had a whole series of uh, spring one-on-one sessions got canceled. So, you know, I'd lost income doing that. And quite a few years ago, 15 years ago, I started a course called Portfolio Development. And I taught it for a company called Better Photo. And I taught it for about eight years. And I'd always thought, I might revive that someday. And that's what I did. I had already written the lessons and now I'm offering online mentoring and that will, um, uh, you know, it's a month, it's a four week uh, editing course basically. So I coach people in, in finding themes in their work and organizing their work in a um, cohesive way that communicates what they want to say. And most people are pretty scattered. You know, a lot of us photograph a lot of different things, but it gives people a chance to um, see what they've been doing and take take it further. Instead of just having portfolios of vacations, you know, it's all those waterfalls on all those vacations. You know, becomes a series uh, of intimate waterfall portraits that really mean something to the photographer and. And when they mean more for the photographer, then more is, uh, you know, more is translated to the viewer. You say, wow, that guy's really into waterfalls, and I love what he was seeing. And, and it's, uh, it's a positive experience for the photographer to go through that process and positive to, to see people recognizing what, where your passions lie. It's four weeks, right? So how do you, you, do you come back every week with an assignment or modification? Yeah, I have the lessons go out. And so uh, this is the beginning of the month right now in July. And so lessons are going out this week. And next week, my students will be on Zoom with me for an hour and a half. And then after that session is over, they get lesson two and a week two lessons, and et cetera, till, till the final the final exam on week four, where they come up, uh, almost invariably come up with a, a much more cohesive, highly refined, uh, a, a kind of a, st- uh, a stable or a consistent quality, not stable, but consistent quality all the way through uh, something I, I drive home in my lessons. So it's basically making somebody a better photographer through editing and and theme development are you are you finding an age range um with this uh, the group of people that you're working with or is it uh, is it broad uh, it's fairly broad it's it's uh mostly a lot of my students are are about to retire or, or have retired so it's something where um uh it don't have a lot of younger people which it'd be nice if it if no, that were the case, but it's probably, it might be financially an issue for them. I, I don't know, but um, it worked out great. So it, it's completely replaced that income lost. And during the spring, I've been finishing up the new book too. So that's, that's been a big focus. Uh, that didn't really, I mean, the publishing, publishing got delayed because of COVID problems. All right. And, but uh, it's off press and on a, on a boat over here now and, will be out in August. Good. And that's the, uh, the light on the landscape uh, book, which light on the landscape. Yeah. I have it on my PDF and, um, it's it one, I mean, I love having my hard copy books. So don't, uh, you know, my readers and everybody don't get me wrong. I think there's nothing that can replace a, 
a book just like nothing can replace a print. Um, if there's one thing I'd advocate, it's you don't have a photograph until you have a print. So, you know, I've got five printers and I'm always printing one nice one here at home and four down at the gallery in the studio. Um, but one of the things that I always love um, is being able to have it on uh, an iPad because I can sit at breakfast and read the words and uh, get in a little bit deeper to it and make sure that I have proper time. But, you know, on a trip or an airplane, I pull out one of these things and, um, you know, try to find inspiration and try to, you know, kind of tune my head to looking at things differently or making sure I see things that way. So I love the electronic versions, but they're thinking replace the tactile feel of a book or a print in my, my hands. So um, something about that. And that's what I like about what you specially do. You're a fine art printmaker and it's always fun to go into Ansel Adams gallery or any place and, and see your prints. So, um, Tell us a little bit about the whole print concept. You've been selling prints for a long time. It's been a, a long evolution. I mean, I I started printing digitally in '94, uh, so just before uh, it really started to catch on, I was working with a company called Evercolor, and uh, so I was doing kind of a predecessor print to to uh, light jet, uh, light jet printers, and so uh, I started to see the advantages of doing that early on. I'm not sure how I stumbled into it, but um, so, so I worked with scanning four by fives and printing them digitally uh, since that, you know, mid nineties. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it was a time where the files, a raw file from a four by five is about the way I had them scanned anyway, is about 300 megabytes. So you put a few layers on that and you get up, you know, toward a gigabyte. And so processing power back then was, was a big problem. So the labs had the computers to do that. So at a certain point, I was just uh, having them do the work. And um, then somewhere, I guess it was maybe the mid-90s, I got connected to Bill Atkinson, and he was, had his own drum scanner, and, and I got a chance of learning from him and, and getting film scanned and, and at his place and you know, he was uh, an evangelist for digital printing oh, yeah. and kind of a pioneer in a lot of ways. And so that was a great advantage to have, have his, uh, his tutelage. And, you know, I started to realize uh, how much, you know, I needed my own computer. And, and along that time, you know, prices started to go down. It didn't cost you $10,000 to get a, get a Mac. You could only spend $5,000. Yeah, it was pretty expensive. <laughs> you know, but... But slowly, you know, as, as the processing got better and the prices came down, I got, you know, eventually got in full control and then you know, started, started using inkjet printers early on. I had a Epson 7600 and, um, using Bill's uh, profiles, which he was famous for doing. Always fun about Bill. Um, boy, my head would always, always hurt after I spent a few hours with him but you learn so much. And for a guy that was colorblind, it was hard to believe he was with it at the time, making some of the best color profiles ever. He was using science, you know, he had the densitometer and, and he realized that the manufacturers were not making good profiles. So you know, it took a while, several years for uh, some of the manufacturers to realize that everybody was using, <laughs> and Bill was giving away the profiles. Sure. You know, eventually they ended up, you know, on the manufacturer's site. And so people all around the world were, were downloading Bill's profiles. I actually and getting much, and getting much better print. He has a series of uh, test printing targets too. you know, high key, medium and, and dark and a few others. And God, I must have, I must have those. I don't know how long I've had them, but they are still a good way to evaluate, you know, a, a printer the first time out, you know, and, um, he was just so good at that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, nice to be able to consider him a friend. And I'm not much of a technical technical geek, so fortunately, I have a few friends like Bill and Joseph Holmes, Charlie Kramer, that are great artists, but also much more technically oriented than I am. So, so I um, I go Bogart off of them. Your book will be out sometime in the next month or so. Is that correct? Yeah, what's going on now is I'm I have a pre-order offer for 
a deluxe edition book package. So I asked the publisher if they would print some kind of a short run of hardbounds uh, that we could sell, you know, to, to the serious book collector. And those are being offered on my website with a choice of nine different images. That's one thing that's going on now. And then the hardbound will be, um, and, and the softbound will be available in August. So they're, um, like I said, they're on a ship coming over from South, uh, South Korea. And I have advanced coffee, copies and uh, it came out great. You know, I, I can't, I wait, I can't wait to see the hard copy. Um, we'll put links in the article and, and below in the, uh, the video description so people can find those on your site. Um, and, you know, there, there should be treasured items. I, Bill's photography is, is exceptional. Um, I, I consider myself fortunate to have, the, you know, the Antarctica Dreams book and this and uh, always just seeing his prints. Just an amazing, amazing photographer. And, um, you know, hopefully you, as readers, you'll get a chance to stop by his website and take a look at what he's doing. And, you know, if you're even uh, more motivated and interested, um, think about uh, doing one of his four-week um, uh, mentoring classes that he's doing right now. But more than anything else, when it's safe to do so again, uh, go out and shoot with Bill because oh, I learned so much from my five days shooting with Bill and doing the video. And, um, you know, to this day, it's, when, I'm, when I'm shooting something special or something that comes back from that, you know, it's like I, I think back to, to Bill and it's like, I just got to thank Bill, man. Thanks. You, know, you, you had me seeing and looking different, you know? Yep. Shooting landscapes, put on your telephoto. Yep. <laughs> it was some good times. Um, I know I could go on and on and talk a, a lot more. Um, you know, Bill's got great techniques, got a lot of other things, but um, I just kind of wanted to catch up with Bill right now and just, you know, because I haven't seen him for a while and, and uh, make sure that all the viewers and the readers know that, you know, he's out there. He's one of the old masters. Um, uh, there's not a lot of ego there. There's just a lot of appreciation and a lot of generosity and, and, throughout the years with outside photographer, outdoor photographer magazine and um, with the classes and everything he's done, just very generous and sharing his knowledge with everyone and, um, you know, making sure that people that really care about photography can care for it and have the passion that, you know, Bill's had all his life with it. Um, so Bill first, thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm glad I can count you as one of my good friends and, you know, we do talk and it's always great to meet up with you out in the field. If I can just add one thing about the book that that wanted to uh, mention is that for 23 years, I've written this column for Outdoor Photographer. So the new book is not only full of photographs, 128, but 60 essays. So in terms of, you know, telling stories about my experiences and my approach, you know, is, is condensed down to uh, 60 essays in this book. So uh, it's nice to be... You know, to, to have a book featuring my writing too a little bit more so I think that adds value to the book it definitely does and um, like I said it was your essays you know that I was following for all those years before we even met so um, they hold great value in my opinion um, look you know I, hopefully we'll see each other uh, soon in the Yosemite when this whole thing is over matter of fact we will probably try to meet out there and celebrate a whole group of us I would hope um, you know, we're in very, very different times now. Um, I still can get out and photograph because I go out by myself, um, which you know, I, I, the only thing I'm safe distancing myself from are bears and mooses, but I don't even have a lot of those in Indiana. But, um, you know, it's, it's certainly bringing a lot of reflection into things. And on one of those reflections that it brings into things, obviously many people that I've been following me know that um, my father-in-law died of this and my wife was really sick of from the, the COVID. Uh, luckily, I've managed to keep good health, but you begin to realize how important things are that you're leaving behind. And um, I'm sure we'll find another chance to do a video where we can discuss all that. But, you know, think about your work. Think about how, you know, it stays and what you're doing. Bill, you, you've got such a collection of prints and those prints especially signed ones, are, are um, your legacy, as well as your books. Yeah, true. 
So yeah, well, it's satisfying for sure to have to put all the work in and have it kind of all come together a little later in life. Yeah, it's it's some you know at least we strive to that and learn that that's where it has to be. So um, just just saying, kind of a, a Kevin comment. Um, I become more appreciative of that in my work, and uh, you know specifically encourage everybody uh, to think that. Uh, you know, you always think, well, I can do that tomorrow. Or I'll get around to that in the next year or so. And um, as I found out with, you know, my father-in-law and a couple friends, you know, for that time sometimes isn't given to us. So, you know, if you can do it now, please be safe out there and uh, take care of yourself um, and just do all the things that you always do. And uh, I just want to thank you on behalf of all the photographers that benefited from your knowledge as I have. Thank you for, uh, being so kind and sharing that with us. Thanks for coming to Antarctica with me, and thank you for doing the master series that we did together. Um, it's been a true pleasure to count you as one of my blessed friends. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate it. Take care of yourself. I want to thank all the readers for uh, watching this, and Bill, obviously. Uh, we try really hard here at Photo PXL and Rock Hopper Workshops to uh, let you see all aspects of photography, and our motto is to. Uh, enhance the, your vision and we're trying to do that every day with what we do so thanks very much and if you like this video and you're on YouTube click the bell and subscribe and uh, other than that just step back in we're gonna be doing more of these when we come up Bill once again thanks very much and take care everybody stay safe <laughs>